Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Fruit Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Oh, hi, Nikki. Welcome to Book hi. Talk, part two. Book Talk, yeah. yes. Yeah, we're back. The book that I haven't read yet. Well, you started it. <laughs> You start, I, but this is a topic. I think this is more barely. of a barely. <laughs> this is more I of a barely started. I it. <laughs> know, I know, but but this is more of a topic of a, a set of ideas that we want to talk about. I think more than anything else, yeah. Bef- and 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 it just is a nice pairing to the book talk that we did last time. So I, I you know, I've got ideas and bullets from the book. Yes, it's been a long time since I read the book, and so uh, you know, really, we we just want to talk about the overall idea set. And, and why it resonates, if it resonates. And the book, of course, is Oliver Berkman's The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. And um, it is just a nice pair to 4,000 Weeks, which we talked about last week. If you haven't heard that episode, go back one week and check it out. because And then read these books, because they're great. They're, yeah, uh, very good. And, and so that's what we're going to talk about that this week. I was actually, I'm glad that we're talking about The Antidote, because we, we had optimism on our Thing. Like we really wanted to talk about optimism in our editorial calendar. I was like, we just did optimism in October of last year. <laughs> like, how bad we we need to talk We're about optimism? Just so We're so optimistic. Here. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, that's uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Before we dig in, though, you know the drill. Everybody come and hang out with us at TakeControlADHD.com. You can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list uh, right there on the homepage. And we will uh, send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD, And you can connect with me at Mastodon, Pete Wright at Mastodon.social. But to really connect with us, join us in the ADHD Discord community. It's super easy to jump in the general community chat channel. Just visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord, and you will be whisked over to the general invitation and login. Of course, if you are looking for a little bit more, if you really want to help support this show, which has been functioning largely on member support from the beginning, how about that? Uh, or, you know, if you just feel like you have a better relationship with your ADHD, thanks to some of the stuff we might have said on past episodes, please consider becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. That's where you jump in and and do your part for listener supported podcasting. With a few dollars a month, you can help guarantee that we continue to grow the show, add new features and invest more heavily in this very community. Thank you, all members who are currently supporting the show. And for new members, if you've been thinking about it, if you're using the new year to uh, support some new projects that you care about, and we happen to be one of them, thank you as well. Nikki, hi, it's me, Pete. Hi. From the podcast. Hi, Pete. I'm the optimistic yes. one. Yes. Really? <laughs> what are you looking at me that way? Am I, do I give off that vibe that I'm just so not optimistic that you have to give me the side eye when no, I pretend to gonna be? No, I'm going to say if you, if it was a, com- a competition between me and you, I'm going to say, I think I would win. Uh, you would absolutely win. <laughs> you would absolutely win. There is no, there's no, ch- I mean, I, I don't know why I, I just, I, maybe I have an easier time <laughs> finding the depth. <laughs> than you do. <laughs> no. I don't need a flashlight. No. So we're talking no. about this book, The Antidote, uh, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking by Oliver Berkman. Oliver Berkman's fantastic. He's uh, done a lot of uh, journalistic work for the BBC. Uh, he's got a great accent and his audiobooks are fantastic. We did 4,000 Weeks last uh, last time. We all, mm. we, both of us felt um, like our time is running out. And so I guess this is the follow up. Now we're going to feel we're not being yeah. very. <laughs> right, we're going to try to not optimistic about the time. Yeah, I'm going to try uh, to wrap yeah. that up. What do you recognizing that you haven't read the book? What do you think about it? Like you, and what you know, and what you've read about it. Well, what I what I read was the back page. No, I read the <laughs> I did read the back, and then I read like the very first few pages where he talks about going to a uh, motivation a motivational speaker undercover, Mm -hmm. um, which I thought was funny, but no, what caught me though is on even just the back page, it says, you know, and there is an alternative path to happiness and success that involves embracing failure, pessimism, insecurity, and uncertainty. Uh, the very things we spend our lives trying to avoid. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I feel like you have to 
you do have to have some darkness to really appreciate the light. Yeah. And there's things that we learn when we're in those darker times that we wouldn't learn if we never had them. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think it's all important. Yeah, I, 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 yes. And that is, that's a lot of the vibe of the book, which, you know, I mean, it opens with this negative path where he's talking about figuring out how to embrace uncertainty, insecurity as a part of the human experience. Like this is what we're going through every day. Why do we try to hide from it? And why do we pay people so much to try to help us hide from it? Right. He does not mm-hmm. have a, uh, I, I would say, a, a high opinion of the self-help industry. Uh, no. E- even as he's writing a book that is a part of it. Right. Right. Like, right. He, yeah. He's... It's the same kind of vibe that you get from, you know, reading 4,000 weeks yeah. that he's not big on the productivity experts either. Yeah. So he definitely has a different opinion and, um, you know, which, which, is good. I mean, we need to have different opinions. I I don't know if he's right or wrong. I don't know. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was a there was a time when and and he was a guest on our he's been a regular guest on our show, Dodge Ray, Dr. Dodge. uh, He and I did this podcast called The Change Paradox. You were on that show. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so much of of Dodge's bent was similar to Berkman's, which was like that if you go back to sort of uh, Buddhism or uh, Vipassana, like what we're looking at through these alternative spiritual practices is embracing everything, right? Embracing discomfort, yeah. embracing uncertainty to become one with it so that it no longer has power over you, right? If you're running from it, it can become a monster, right? That, that's mm-hmm. kind of the idea. Mm-hmm. As long as mm-hmm. you have something in the closet, if you can't see it, if there's a monster in the closet, that monster is giant. But as Dodge has said, and I kind of embraced, shame hates the sun, right? As soon as right. you bring something out into the light, it shrinks. And, and that is a lot of what Berkman is sort of leaning into, which is this idea that we're fixating on positive thinking on, uh, you know, Instagram perfect in a way that's actually putting us in a space of denial. And that Mm -hmm. only sets us up for more, um, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt in our lives. And, And I think that is really interesting. He goes on to cite, you know, research around it and leads into this conversation around that a toxic positivity. And I can't, have we talked about toxic positivity on this show? We have a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, but but tell us well, what it is. Toxic positivity is is uh, you know toxic. It's kind of a nickname for overly positive thinking, right? And it's it's been the subject of a lot of of research. Um, it, it refers to the excessive sort of. Uh, ineffective overgeneralization of happy and optimistic states, right, across all situations where we're just going to be happy even when things are objectively ha- hard and sad. Mm-hmm. And it can, th- this this nature, you run into somebody who's toxically positive who says, you know, just smile, right? Like all the time, go ahead and smile. That invalidates genuine emotional experiences that you might be trying to have in your life or might be naturally experiencing in your life. And that leads to like minimization and denial and all these sorts of states uh, that that allow us to hide from our um, our authentic selves, our authentic human experience. Mm-hmm. So um, we want to avoid toxic positivity. That That's the kind of stuff where you, you find you're emotionally suppressing, where uh, it can impact your relationships, where you, you are, um, you know, you're in denial about the state of your relationships because you all you see are the positive and you don't see that that things might be challenged between, you know, either romantic partners or social groups. Uh, you have reduced resilience because you don't know how to embrace negativity, you face higher degrees of rejection and RSD, rejection sensitivity. Um, So there are Mm. all kinds of things that go on with toxic positivity or overly generalized uh, positivity. And that is, uh, it's important enough for Berkman that he kind of opens the book with this. Like there are limits to positive thinking and we have to have um, you know, what he uses coined by John Keats, a negative capability, uh, yeah. this ability to remain comfortable with uncertainty and doubt without the rush to find closure or resolution. That's a tough place. It is a tough place. How do you see that come uh, come into play with your with your coaching, with the people that you're working with? 
you know, we talked a little bit about this Pete yesterday when we were talking about something else. And I think that the the where this gets uncomfortable is that like with ADHD, it doesn't just go away. Mm-hmm. And so uh in coaching, it's not trying to necessarily um well, we're not trying to make the ADHD go away. We're trying to work with the ADHD. Yes. We're trying to accept that this is part of um, how you may process time, how you take in information, how long it takes you to do something. You know, ADHD affects all of those things. And we can find um, ways to work with it, but we can't just pretend that it doesn't exist or pretend like it's going to all of a sudden, if I can just do this, it's going to be better. Like it's still going to be there. So. And, and there's still going to be bad days. Yeah. So what I think when I'm reading this information and hearing you talk is that, you know, there's still going to be bad days. We need to not, uh, not valid. We need to validate that, mm-hmm. that it's okay to have a bad day and say, this really sucked today. I just want to go to bed, yeah. <laughs> you know, and start again later and be okay with that. So I, I, I that's how, it's uncomfortable because no one wants to be in uncertainty and doubt, but we don't know. I mean, the future is uncertain. We, we really don't know. Yeah. I, I think that's really the, I think that's the challenge. And I think when, um, you know, when I, in this space of ADHD, you know, we've been thinking so much about these ideas of like, well, if we could just solve or I, I you know, I want to mask my ADHD mm-hmm. somehow. Right. I I want I don't want people to judge me. I don't want people to look at me and think, does that guy have ADHD? Is that is his problem? He can't focus because of ADHD. Like, I don't want him to know. So I, I put all of these these barriers up that um, that protect me. And I just like try to live outside in in this I try to hide from the uncertainty, hide from the the image that I'm that I'm presenting when the truth is very few people care. (laughs) And it's like the relationship. I was just thinking when you said that, I'm like, I wonder how many people are actually actually really thinking what you just said. And I I just I can't see it. It's hard to see. Well, it is. People would say that. But but that's so much of like self-judgment and self-loathing. Right. Like that's so much of it is is it is feeling that way. And so so when you look at uh, the the positive thinking industrial complex, right, like this, you're creating you're creating a mask that doesn't exist. And when it goes when we go back to the, um, you know, to all the uh, traits of toxic positivity, like it, it can have a, a, a direct physical health impact. Right. They're researching how like not embracing or not understanding or leaning into negative thoughts and embracing the fact that everybody has, as you say, hard days. And there is there is such a thing as grief that you cannot hide from. Yeah. Um, th- then it, it can it can have negative physiological impacts. Right. And and mm-hmm. we have to be able to to lean into all of those things back to what Dr. Dodge taught me, which is like the act of embracing, leaning into fear and uncertainty, admitting out loud with others. I don't understand this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know why my brain works the way it does. I don't know why I'm scared of that thing, but I'm scared of that thing. And leaning into those things, that is the first positive step toward getting to the other side of it, to reducing the power that it has over you, to to actually, um, you know, being one with the uncertainty to the point that you can live your life without it looming over you. And and that is so much of the message that I get out of of Berkman's book, which is mm-hmm. lean in like we're going to he's going to say yeah. it in a nice British accent. But really, it's lean in. Don't be afraid of of this stuff, because all these other tools that the industry is giving you is just a mask. You haven't actually yeah. leaned in at all. Um, he hmm. he talks. I mean, he, he goes into the uh, he has this whole thing on the visiting the um Museum of of failed products, right? To to look at all the the failure of um, the uh, what we need to be able to learn from failure, right? The things that failure teaches us to be able to do better next time. And if we're so afraid of failing, if we're just trying to put a mask of positivity on uncertainty and fear, we're not going to learn. We're not going to learn. Yeah, um, I believe that. He does dive into stoicism. What do you know of stoicism? Are you a stoic? 
define what you mean by stoic. Well, stoicism is the is the ancient Greek philosophy that advocates a, a more accepting approach to stoicism, that focusing on things within our control is the priority and just accepting the things we cannot change. It's the it's what if the, the prayer, like, Lord, give me the strength to accept the things yeah. I cannot change. Um, and I it's, it, it is there is a different there's a, another layer to it, like the aesthetic stoic, uh, 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 the aesthetic stoic, which is, uh, you know, I I am um, I'm a minimalist too, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to reduce the number of things that have any sort of control and authority over me in any way, shape or form. And so I'm, I am disavowing as many material things that are beyond my needs or capacity. Um, but one of the angles that, that Berkman talks about is the practice of negative visualization, right? This comes out of stoicism oh, right. that encourages people to periodically imagine the worst case scenarios, right? So could you get in a car wreck right now if you're driving on the highway? Yes, you could. Now, there are some really worst case scenarios there. And his idea is, or the idea presented in this in this section is like, if you go to the worst case scenario, if you really allow yourself to live there for just a little bit, you actually find it reduces anxiety about the future and it makes you more resilient over time, right? Because you understand that when you compare your real lived experience right now, present in time with the worst case scenario that you can possibly imagine, you realize how far the gap is between those two things, right? So yeah, I, yeah. And, and that ends up being important in you know, uh, clear-headed mental health. So what's interesting about that is I, I've i asked that question before mm -hmm. to clients. Like something will come up and I'll be like, what is the worst case scenario here that can happen? Right. And I I agree that it does it does put things in perspective because once they verbalize it, they realize that, okay, that really isn't that bad or it's really unlikely that that would happen or, you know, they can mm -hmm. start uh, processing that. Uh, but what's so interesting about this is that I could go to the worst case scenario, uh, have it be really bad. I'm talking about anxiety mm -hmm. and then have to go back through that, this whole stoic philosophy of, okay, I only have what I can control right now. And I can't worry about what's going to happen in the future if I don't know what's going to happen in the future and it hasn't happened yet. And I really don't have control to change it. Yeah. <laughs> like I go through a whole thing there, right? Yeah. Like, so there's a lot of um, roller coasting when I look at what stoic perspective is. Well, I, I think I'm in it in a lot of different places. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> and, and me too. And this is where that kind of falls apart, right? Which is, you know, if you are living with anxiety, if you're, if you're living in that dark place, mm -hmm. sometimes just disavowing the power of positive thinking is a bit of a slight, right? Sometimes what you need is not to imagine the worst case, because if I go to the worst case too long, I will stay there, right? If oh, I, like, sure. it's yeah. what mom said, if you cross your eyes too long, they'll stick. Okay, yeah. well... <laughs> Like, it, you know, so on the one hand, you kind of know that that's that's home turf for me is living in that right. dark space. And so why would I want to invite myself to it at the same time? Let's go back to the to leaning into the things that make us uncomfortable. This is all about a, a practice, right? This is about mm -hmm. creating a practice of 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 not not positive thinking, but of of being a an authentic rationalist, right? Which says, yeah. look, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to recognize that things can be hard, but I'm going to live in the space of, of optimism. I'm going to live mm -hmm. in the space that I, I, of the stuff that I can control right now, this cup is clean. It is disease free and it's full of my favorite tea. I can control <laughs> that. Right. Right. Like I don't right. have to worry about myself running into another car or a tree or something like that when I'm driving around because I'm not driving right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what can I what can I really uh, lean in on right now? And this goes back yeah. to one of the things that he's he, he kind of leans in on is, is meditation and mindfulness. And um, 
you know, he talks about the, the Buddhist philosophy. And I think what's important to note is that because we say we talk about mindset all the time, right? That's kind of a that's kind of a, a jam that we have. And I, I think it's important to say as a footnote to all of this, mindset is not equal to positive thinking. And I think a lot of people, as I've been listening to other sources as we're working on this other project, a lot of people mistake having, a, you know, setting yourself up for a certain kind of mindset as being veiled or coded language for just be happy all the time. That's really interesting. I've never I've never seen that before. So mindset is not positive thinking. I have to I have to wrap my head around that. Well, the idea right, the idea is when we say, you know, growth mindset. Let's talk Carol Dweck. Does right. Carol Dweck mean when she says, "Hey, here's a you've got to have a growth mindset." Do you think Carol says be happy? No, I think she's saying take failure as a learning opportunity and grow from that. Don't get stuck in the fixed mindset of this is all it is ever going to be always. Yeah, I think that's the that's the point. And I think the industry, when you talk about mindset, positive mindset, growth mindset, it has taken over the word in a way that um, that becomes coded language for you know, just be happy all the time. And I think a lot of people who are, you know, frustrated with, um, you know, the world around them and positive thinking and toxic positivity, what they hear when they hear the word mindset is, you know, just be happy all the time and and resent it, emotionally resent it. And I think that's a, that's one of the things that we want to kind of correct that says mindset can be growth mindset. It can be positive mindset. It can also be a negative mindset. It can be a mindset of embracing failure as a learning opportunity. It can be a mindset is just a is just an ideological positioning at any given moment, and it can change with context. And that is a thing that I think about with ADHD all the time. Sometimes when I let myself go or when I find myself lost in a project last night, I was up way too late. Nikki Kinzer. Oh, my mm. God. Mm. He was just gone. I'm sorry, because that's my fault. <laughs> OK, it was your fault. But it was good, right? <laughs> like it was a, I was in a creative mindset. And what yeah. comes with the mindset is a cost. And that cost is sleep, diet, all the things that I'm quite familiar with, intimately familiar mm -hmm. with the costs of creativity. And yet I was in it. And I needed to be in it. I needed to work yeah. through some stuff. I had to work through some stuff, Nikki. And, I know. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes you have to do that. But I think the, the point of, of, of thinking about practicing confrontation of discomfort means not hiding from mindsets that make you uncomfortable, right? Not hiding from the costs of, of where you are in any given context. And, and, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a piece that challenges, that is challenged by the antidote, which is you you don't have to hide. You don't have to hide from, yeah. from your feelings. That's a really, it, it, it makes me ponder. I want to think a little bit more about that because I, I think that's interesting because yeah. I, I agree. I think there's too much. It's so easy to uh, think that they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so to, especially because I've used the words before, you know, are you that negative internal conversation, that negative mindset. It's right. like, okay, wait a minute. That's more of like how you're feeling at the time or how you want to approach something. It is different than... This is a great question for you, though. This is a great yeah. question for you. How does it, does this whole conversation on mindset impact you from the perspective of a coach when you think about limiting beliefs? What is the difference between a limiting belief and a negative mindset? You stumped me, but I'm going to do my best without having a lot of time to think about it. Um, you know, I think they're similar in some ways, but I think you can still have a limiting belief and still um, and still have a growth mindset around it, if that makes sense. Like, I think that if you think about limiting beliefs, what are those? Those are, That's that conversation that we're having with ourselves that's telling us that we can or can't do something. We think it's true. It may be, it may not be. Uh, is it a limiting belief that I can't sing? Not really, because I really can't sing. Um, <laughs> it's just a fact. 
is just a fact, right? No, a limiting yeah. belief might be, I can never learn to sing. I can never learn to sing. And, you know, but I could. So what if right. I, if, if I can... If I if that's something I really want to do, I think I believe I can work on my mindset to have it be more open to the opportunity and open to the the possibility that maybe I could learn how to sing. Even if I still kind of believe that, I'm I'm having a mindset that is letting me approach it in a different way to actually try and not just stay not doing it because I don't believe I can do it. Yeah. So I don't know if that explains anything, but that's kind of how I see it. Well, I think it does. And just sort of riffing a little bit, I think the whole idea of um, being able to accommodate the experience of we'll talk about singing just because that's where you started, like being able to accommodate the fact that I I can't I can't sing as a variant of I can't sing yet or I can't sing right now. I could sing if I wanted to. I don't. I don't want to learn mm -hmm. to sing, right? Like mm -hmm. being able to embrace the fact that I, I've i made a choice. I've had agency in this conversation. Like there are things that, that I have thought I might want to do in the past and now I don't want to do it is in fact leaning in to the uncertainty and making a commitment and living in that space and saying, look, I, I know things things can be it, it could be hard and there are other hard things I'm going to do instead. Like I've made it I've made yeah. a choice. And and that feels to me the end run around the limiting belief. Right. So much of the limiting belief is a per, is a fixed perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a binary mm -hmm. that that yeah. I'm I'm in a space right now and I can't ever get out. Right. I've fallen right. and I can't get up. Uh, right. And that's the thing that that we want to that we want to work to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. It it also he, he goes into this um, a, a bit of a riff on anti fragility, which was uh, a term coined by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote a book called Anti Fragile. And the, his entire perspective, Taleb, which is is that, you know, we gain systems gain from disorder. People should aim to be anti-fragile, embracing stressors and shocks as a way to grow stronger. And I think it's, it, you know, it's a, a response is an academic. It seems to me like a response to some of the safe spaces that he's, he's seeing around, you know, uh, complicated conversations when the truth is, like, we are capable of having hard conversations that don't resort to violence and rage and, and, and hurt. Um, yeah. And, and can just be conversations on ideology that don't impact us so deeply to our core. And I, I like posing that question at those of us living with ADHD because that is such an identity card, right? We, we live with ADHD. Identity is, is ADHD. I identify as ADHD positive, right? You know? Um, <laughs> yeah. And that means that it comes with certain challenges. It comes with a roller coaster of figuring out meds. It comes with a roller coaster of trying to understand how mindfulness and peace exist in a mind that's constantly on fireworks. It it is uh it's just complicated, right? It's complicated. It leads to judgment at work and at school and all the different places. And also, uh, what am I learning from that disorder? every day that helps tomorrow be make me a little stronger even if i'm still living with disorder how do i feel a little bit stronger and resilient as a result of it and so i i walk away from you know th thinking about this book again as an exploration of how i live with uncertainty and rejection in a way that leads not to just puzzling through what rejection is but leads to what does courage mean Mm. Right. What does it mean to be courageous in the face of all of the things of that this. I'm trying to hide from? Right. right if right. if if we're hiding from things is the core uh, like nut of the uh, antidote, which is like you're hiding from stuff behind positive thinking models. <laughs> If I right. stop hiding, then how can I, how do I use those things? Do I face them and stare at them right in their stupid faces and mm -hmm. say, I'm going to be courageous and, and run right through it? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, I love that. What does it mean? I think it's great. I don't know. I don't know if it's I great. I, well, I think it is. <laughs> I mean, I think... <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know what anybody else is going to think, but uh, no, I think that the, I mean, just the word courage, right. I think is important. And I think that when we're talking about resiliency and we're talking about, you know, the beginning of the conversation, ADHD is going to show up. So how yeah. do we work with that? How do we bounce back and have a good day tomorrow? Or maybe we don't have a good day tomorrow and that's okay too, right? That's kind of going into leaning into whatever's yeah. happening as well. Um, so no, it, it all feels very balanced to me. I think that uh, it, it, it keeps going back to that these things are going to happen. So the fight is not about preventing them from happening. It's, it's how do you stay standing? How do you get back up and still find joy and yeah. still find, you know, all of the beautiful things that life has to offer? He, you could tell he's still thinking about, he's thinking about his, the time he has left Berkman because right. he, he talks about mortality a bunch, uh, uh, you know, which is uh, definitely the core. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. So it's OK. <laughs> um, the, and and reflecting on, uh, you know, reflecting on on mortality. So that's definitely a, a part of the book. Um, he also the 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 other piece he talks about, which I know I've mentioned in the uh, recently is talking about this whole idea of the obsession, not only do we have this obsession with positive thinking, we also have an obsession with goal setting. And just as a, as a <gasps> reminder, right, of 4,000 weeks is that being too focused on specific goals blinds us to opportunities that can create a constant sense of failure, right? It's that we're constantly thinking about these goals and we're missing things around us and we're, we're not catching the, the, you know, forest for the trees, kind of perspective, which I think is interesting. And it goes back to the thing. The thing I'm actually thinking about is Mike, Mike Schmitz, uh, you know, and, and his perspective, like if you just take care of your routines, the goals take care of themselves. Right. And in that light, Berkman suggests that happiness should be approached indirectly instead of striving for happiness as the goal in and of itself. It's better pursued as a byproduct of living a life aligned with one's values. I bring you back to courage. If you value courage in your life, if what you are doing is 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 looking through the negativity, if you're just doing the work every day in a courageous and open manner, that should fulfill the equation and lead toward the goal of happiness, whatever that is for you, right? I I am thinking more and more about that equation and what are the things that I'm doing every day that lead me to have a better end of day, right? So that right. I have a better weekend, so that I have a better month, so that I have a better year, so that I have a better life. And mm -hmm. uh, and so focusing on the daily exploration of values uh, mm -hmm. as a result, uh, you know, leading toward larger mm -hmm. experiences of happiness. So um, last little footnote. Mm. Yes. Uh, this is also <laughs> the... Um, cultural reflection of us living in the West, that uh, we have an emphasis on individual happiness and su success. And Berkman says, you know what, that's pretty isolating and unrealistic. And maybe there are some other cultures in the world that have nailed this, and we just rushed past it and should stop, slow down and consider, is there another model that might lead us to happiness if we stop thinking just for ourselves? Just saying. He, he, you know, Berkman, not me. Um, right. <laughs> he's uh, and uh, uh, so I, I don't know. I guess that's a, that's we've kind of talked about all my other points as we get to the the end. Yeah. I think it's a, a really interesting uh, book and leads to some reconsideration of a lot of our assumptions around, you know, positive thinking, self positive thinking. toxic positivity, the works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I agree because I, I do think there's this pressure of if it, to want to be positive, I have to be positive. That I should be thinking of this as in a positive way, and yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, and that's that toxic stuff. Yeah, that you were it's it's about. snake oil. It's snake oil. Yeah, you don't have to yeah. be happy all the time. You don't have to buy no. into to positivity culture. Like you can be authentic and human, and and we recognize humanity is is a yeah. thing uh, adhd is it not is a thing <laughs> adhd is not solved right no and no. in fact you might argue solving your adhd would not make you happy 
No, you know? it's just like getting rich isn't going to yeah. make you happy. Right. Because so, yeah, that's not the absolutely. point. Right. Yeah. So, all right. Good stuff. Thank you, Pete. Well, thank you, Nikki. What a great opportunity to revisit this, uh, revisit the book and Berkman and links in the show notes. You got to check these things out and his, uh, his shorts on Audible. I know I mentioned them last week. Um, he's got a bunch of shorts that have been released that he did for the BBC and they're great, great stories and give much more fodder for thinking. So thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us on this show. Thank you for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute about this conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in the Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the Deluxe Level or Better. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we will see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD Podcast. Mm-hmm.